Okay. <clears throat> good morning, good, after, good afternoon, and good evening to anyone who's joining us today. My name is Janice Davistein, and on behalf of the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative, I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar today entitled Transitional Feeding and Beyond. First, we'd like to thank our generous sponsors who allow the work of ITSI to continue and who support the implementation of ITSI around the world. So just a few quick housekeeping before we begin. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our um, website at some point next week. All participants who join us today are in listen only mode, which means that um, our speaker and the, the rest of us here won't hear or see you and your microphone and video will remain off. If you have any questions, you can submit them throughout the presentation. To do this, use the Q&A button on the middle of your menu bar. Um, our speaker today will address questions at the end of um, the presentation and there will be about 10 to 15 minutes for the question and answer period. So ITSI does not currently offer continuing education units, but in the upcoming days, a certificate of attendance will be emailed to anyone attending the session through a computer. I think that's about it for our housekeeping at the moment. So um, I'm just going to move on to introduce our amazing speaker today. It's a huge honor for me, as always, um, to introduce uh, Dr. Joan Arvidsson. Um, she's the Program Coordinator of Feeding and Swallowing Services at Children's Hospital of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, uh, and a Clinical Professor in the Division of Gastroenterology, Department of Pediatrics, Medical College of Wisconsin. And I think all of you know that um, she is an incredibly well-recognized expert in um, pediatric dysphagia and an amazing speaker. So I'm going to uh, hand it over to, to Joan to take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janice. It is a privilege for me to be able to share with you over the next 45 minutes or so, what I've called transition feeding from nipple to spoon to cup to chewable food. And we'll probably do a little bit of a hop, skip, and a jump with some of these. I do have a few videos and photos to share with you. And you will get a PDF file of the text slides for this presentation when you get the certificate. So know that there may be more information in the text slides today than what you would either take down or take notes. So you will get that. So just hopefully relax and enjoy this. Here are the disclosure for both financial and non-financial, you can read that. Our learning objectives include knowledge of the progression of oral skills into transition feeding stages, describe the primary factors necessary to advance feeding, and parents, caregivers must always be actively involved, demonstrate some strategies to expand food types and determine strategies to measure outcomes. We need a whole lot more about measuring outcomes and really defining the efficacy of treat, intervention and treatment. Some of you have heard me before know that this is one of my favorite sayings, education is the greatest need of the people, but first they must be fed. It comes off of Danton's memorial in Paris. He was a primary figure in the French Revolution. I think it's important for us, we often want some kind of a meal or our coffee or tea or something before we start an educational session. But even more so, all of the babies and children that we work with must have their nutrition and hydration needs met. They must be fed, whether it's tube, oral, or some combination. This is a schema that I find helpful. And I have it triangular with arrows reaching around to all of these aspects. It is absolutely critical that every person has a stable airway in order to feed orally. The gastrointestinal tract has tremendous implications for all of us, typical children, as well as children with disabilities, and it affects our interest in feeding and ability to feed. And here I have feeding and swallowing. All of the children that you see, if you're working with children with disabilities, have feeding problems or a feeding disorder because feeding is the broader term from before it gets to the mouth 
into the digestive tract. But swallowing and swallowing problems, remember that's the term dysphagia, swallowing problems. So we have to have all of these things in mind, but a good many of the children you see do not have swallowing problems, especially if you work with children on the autistic spectrum or other children with behavioral sensory feeding disorders, but that's way too much to talk about for today. So what is at the center of all of this? It's the brain. Everything we do is neurologically based, brain-based at one level or another. A reminder for all of us, primary needs for all humans, probably all living beings, respiration and airway. And then here you see I have nutrition and hydration. Every time I say nutrition and I think nutrition, I want everybody to be thinking hydration as well because the adequacy of fluids is absolutely as critical as calories and a balance of nutrition. And everything about feeding should feel good, smell good, taste good. And that's why I have this slide here. And this just happens to be one of my favorite mom and baby photos. Briefly on the anatomy, infant anatomy, the tongue literally fills the oral cavity. Term infants have fat pads in their cheeks and that seems to be able to help their stripping of nipples, their sucking and swallowing, whether they are doing breastfeeding or bottle feeding. Have a relatively small mandible, some of them have a very small mandible and that can be a problem, but the airway, no distinct oral pharynx and the larynx is very high in the neck. Here you see a lateral drawing, which is actually done by a, a graphic artist and is in the pediatric video fluoroscopic swallow manual that Dr. Maureen left in Greif and I did many years ago and they are intended to be copied. So here you see the larynx is very high in the neck, the tongue fills the oral cavity, the tip of the epiglottis and the tip of the soft palate practically touch and sometimes they do overlap. And here's the hyoid bone, very little calcification. By the time we get to a two-year-old, now there's more space for the tongue to move within the mouth and more space between the tip of the soft palate and the epiglottis. So I'm gonna show you it as a schema. Here you see the space and the angle is more of a 90 degree angle. The larynx is lower in the neck as the growth occurs. And now the tongue action can be, have a more vertical tilt to it. And that's what helps to do spoon feeding and then advancing to textured food. And here in comparison is the older child or the adult. So what are texture changes in a typical child? I use the word typical rather than normal. We don't really have enough normative data and I'm not even sure that typical is the best way to describe this. The order of advancing is usually pretty similar, but the time frame in advancing can vary quite a bit. Most infants do liquid by nipple, breast or bottle, and that's the first four to six months of life in term babies. If they are premature, then we have to think about corrected age and also always thinking about developmental levels. And then by about six months, the American Academy of Pediatrics says children are ready to start spoon feeding and that's typically smooth food because they are sitting with minimal support and head control is good as well. So all of these things tie into growth and fine motor skills, as well as what's happening at the mouth and the oral cavity and where cognition is and all of those things fit together. We do need to have children getting lumpy foods by about 10 to 11 months. Now remember, we're talking about typical age range children. That does not mean chunky foods. It does not mean chunks of food in liquid base, like some of our stage three baby foods, commercial foods are in the United States and some other places around the world. It, we talk about a critical and sensitive period for advancing these skills. And for typical children, it can be much delayed if they're not getting this experience by about 14 to 16 months. And we do have some children who they just wanna do their breastfeeding. They just wanna do their bottle feeding. So there are a lot of factors to take into account. Children should be doing some cup drinking by the time they're 12 months of age. It doesn't mean they're off the breast or off their bottle. And then we also think about these other skills that I've already mentioned and the oral sensory motor skills. We have to think about progression of textures and psychosocial milestones as well. I want to show you a brief 
video fluoroscopic swallow study of this infant who is actually preterm, 35 weeks. And there's a lot of air here, so you're not going to really see the pharynx, but I want you to appreciate sock swallow, sock swallow, sock swallow. It's pretty brief, just watch that. She gets a little bit of liquid up around her soft palate, which is probably pretty typical in very young children and not a problem unless it's a greater quantity or if gravity brings it down into the level of the airway. But look at that, sock, swallow, sock, swallow, sock, swallow. And she just keeps that going. Radiologist goes down lower. We make sure it's moved through the esophagus. It's in the stomach. And that's all we did. She looks safe to do oral feeding. I'm not going into any of the reasons as to why she got this study. But there were reasons. Now let's think about five to six months. They're still doing primarily nipple feeding, more up and down tongue action, beginning of puree or smooth foods. They tend to do kind of a sucking motion when the spoon is first introduced, and they tend to spill food out of their mouths to be expected. And I encourage parents, don't wipe that mouth every single time. It gets in the way of the dance, and the dance is what I think of as this interaction. It's a normal part of learning to eat for children to gag on new textures. Now we don't want them gagging a lot. We don't want them to get stressed with it. But it's also very important not to pay too much attention to that gag because then children will learn to gag on purpose because it gets them attention. So we just ignore it, we accept it, and then try to adjust the textures so that they're not doing at least much gagging. We don't want children choking. That can be dangerous and that can block the airway. So we make the texture changes and the size, the amount that they get, appropriate so that they do not end up choking. Now this is a six month old and I just want you to see a brief portion of again, very useful one to one suck to swallow. But I'm going to point out a couple of times where he's going to get a little bit of contrast to the underside of the upper part of the epiglottis. That's what we call penetration. Now that was magnified, you could probably tell that. Once in a while, you see just a little tiny bit of contrast that goes just under the upper part of the epiglottis, clears when he swallows. Look at that, suck, swallow, suck, swallow, suck, swallow. If they do one to three sucks per swallow, they're probably going to be efficient. Did you see that little bit of black contrast? We suspect that is probably pretty typical and acceptable for children. And I wouldn't even test with thickened liquids if this child is basically healthy. He did come to us with a question of asthma, which is a lower airway problem. There was a brief break. He's taking just a little bit more. And he also is going, did you see that? We call that penetration to the underside of the superior part of the epiglottis, clears on completion of the swallow. And he's appropriate to continue. He's going to do a little bit of spoon feeding, so that's why I'm just going to keep this on. We don't know even how many swallows we need to look at. So there are a number of things about infant swallowing, and we don't want them under radiation for terribly long times either. Now, he's just beginning to do spoon feeding. So notice what he does. He gets the food on his tongue and he's kind of moving it back and forth as though he's sucking on it. And then he makes a swallow happen and no residue and it is cleared. So that's a six month old. Spoon feeding starts at about that time. Use a fairly flat spoon because when you get it in on the tongue, when the child opens his mouth to give permission, you put the spoon in at mid tongue, slight downward pressure and come out along the tongue, not up on the palate and not to scrape the mouth or the chin after every bite. Here you see, I'm skipping just a little bit here. You see a father who's still feeding his daughter by infant. She's about four months old, working toward the six month level. I want to point this out because he's holding her so that her trunk, her neck, her head are in a good straight line and well supported. Bottle feeding, that nipple should be straight into the mouth and the lips need to be flared out and touching the rim of the bottle cap. Sometimes the wide base nipple isn't going to allow that to happen, but you want the lips flared as deep as possible 
so that that infant can strip the nipple well and all of that helps to set the stage for spoon feeding in due time as well. The nipple end should always be filled with fluid, otherwise they take in air. Here you see a seven month old who has a very small jaw and he has limited lip action. He has multiple congenital anomalies. And I want to show a little bit of this and I believe my description should be audible to you. So let's just see what happens. We're just gonna show a little bit about spoon feeding. And we come straight on, he opens his mouth and in it goes, slight downward pressure on his tongue. I come back out and he works it and he swallows. Even though he doesn't have a whole lot of lip movement, with his cranial nerve seven damage. Come on, buddy, open up and get it in there. That's a boy. Now he's, you'll notice he isn't losing very much at all. And with the downward pressure on his tongue at mid tongue, that actually helps him to get the best tongue action for swallowing. Now this time, I'm going to show what really is less desirable. Let's just take your head back and I'm just gonna kind of scrape it off his palate, like often is done with young children. Actually, we didn't even let all that much go. Often children will push food back out if it's on their palate. That's a boy. Open right up. See what he does here. If I just kind of leave it up on his palate, he gets more of a supple kind of action. He gets it off the spoon, but not nearly as efficiently. Now we're gonna do just one more bite right at mid tongue. Open up, young man straight in on his tongue. We come out, he's closed pretty well, just a little bit on his face and we're not gonna wipe and scrape with every single bite. Good for you, all right. Look at you helping to hold that cup yourself. I like this wide-lipped clear plastic cup. Gets right into the corner of the mouth. We make sure the tongue is below the cup and the feeder can really control the amount. Now let's just back out a little bit of dribble down the bib, but that's no big deal. And he does like this cup. He's been doing this just a little bit, but he took to it very, very quickly. Much more effective with an open cup. Drinking, here come those hands to help. All right, you put your hands around it. I like the wide lift clear plastic cup. I can see just how much is going in. It gets in the corner of his mouth. I can make sure his tongue is underneath the cup. Stop and it at that tongue. point. I just want to mention that he has a situation in which he has microglossia, a very small tongue, and he has no gag. And that was what got him to me when he was in the NICU. They were very worried about the fact that he didn't have a gag. Was he going to be able to take anything orally? And he had this really small tongue. So I'm going to say right here, the gag in and of itself has no direct relationship to safety of swallowing or ease of swallowing. And that's a simplistic way to think about the gag, but it is important. And here, I will often start young infants, young children with something that's a little bit thicker so you don't spill quite as much and gives them a little more time to make the swallow happen. But children will pick up with this kind of a wider diameter cup, narrower at the bottom. You can have just a little bit in it. You want the head, child to keep his head midline and that's just a part of no, typical advancement of liquid. And then I like cartoons. Here, this little guy says, that mom's been trying to teach me to hold a spoon when I eat. And of course he's gonna use his fingers because that's the appropriate tool at this age. So he's waving the spoon around and says, darned if I know why. Children often like to have a spoon in their hand while somebody else may be feeding them as well. This is the, critical period for solids. It's an old study. It's not a perfect kind of study, but it does really emphasize that we want children starting spoon feeding by about six months of age, if that's where they are with developmental levels, as well as chron chronologic age or corrected age. They have good trunk support for sitting. Anteroposterior action is beginning to be a little bit reduced. They're beginning to do more hand-to-mouth skills, but stay away from mixed textures per bite. That is not little pieces in a liquidy base, no vegetable soup kind of situation. Here's just in a table format, 
age of introduction to solids. So you can see in months how that changes. And to correlate it with the IDSI charts, remember IDSI can really help you describe the textures and figure out the best ways to determine the textures, measure whether it's the off the spoon, whether you're using the fork mash. That's not the purpose of this talk, but I want to bring it back to that. So here it is by chart. And then here I put it in the descriptive terms for foods. So it's levels three liquidized under the liquid and then moderately thick food pureed and extremely thick liquids. So you see they really do overlap. And then the numbers and the descriptors for the food and then with the IDSI guidelines, you can do the measures and determine those most consistent ways to keep advancing and to be able to be more measurable and quantifiable in your outcomes. Seven to nine months, Again, now a gag is becoming more protective, but it doesn't correlate with the swallow. Children are using their mouths a lot. They're putting toys in their mouths, fingers and hands in their mouths. They're getting much more coordinated lip, tongue and jaw movement. Most children at this age drool only when they are teething. We could have a whole talk about drooling, but that's not the purpose of this talk. So drooling was teething for typical children. Cup drinking, the lower lip is a stabilizer by nine months of age. They can get mouth closure around the cup rim and they're beginning to get more lateral tongue action so that as solids are placed at the side, sometimes we call it the low molar tables or the jaws because they don't have the teeth there. But you don't need teeth in order to do that early munching that children do in this age. Now here, another cartoon. Why are PJ's peas squashed? Because he's going to handle something that is mashed better than being in pieces and circles. And I'm going to speak about that in just a minute because circle shapes and I want to get at risk for choking in a few minutes. But for now, let's just talk about cup drinking. Most children will begin to do some cup drinking one or two months after they're doing some spoon feeding. Spout cups are less desirable, at least for many children, because it keeps them sucking in more of a sucking pattern. They usually need to do single sip at first, maybe even thicker liquids initially. Cups may have a flat top to help control the flow. There are many, many different kinds of cups on the market. I'm not even going to discuss those possibilities. There is no perfect cup. Parents do not need to go and by 10 or 15 different kinds of cups. It's the principles. And for those of you who are therapists can help to figure out what the function is and how you can optimize the function. Children learn to do straw drinking at pretty young ages. And that's probably with all the fast food stuff. Here you see fairly flat spoons. There are a number of different types of spoons. You don't want metal for young children because they could hurt their teeth, they could hurt their gums, but it needs to be firm and so it will hold the food and yet not hurt their mouths. And this is just a, an example of this cup. I will tell you, I do find that solo wide lip cup very useful. I do not own stock. I am not promoting a particular brand. What you do need to sort out is that if you squeeze it, will it not break? And if a child would bite on it, will he not bite off a piece because there have been some reports in the literature of children actually getting a fragment of this sort of a cup, the holiday kind of cups into their esophagus or into their airway and has to be surgically removed. We don't want that. We want everything to be safe. And here is a way that if a child has been doing spoon feeding and you have this slightly thinned puree that the child has been taking by spoon and you bring the cup closer to the mouth, still spoon it. And then by the time you take the spoon away and tip the cup, the only thing you have changed is the way that it gets into the child's mouth. And if there's one principle about intervention and facilitating advancing textures, advancing skills, it's figure out what the child can do and then make changes in very small steps in one dimension at a time. Texture, 
or taste or temperature are probably the most common things we change. But if you change taste and texture and the utensil that you put it in there and the child has a problem with it, you don't know where to nail the barrier. And that's the term I use. I always want to be able to nail the barrier so that we can make adjustments and keep that child advancing appropriately with skills and expanding diets. Here are just a few varieties of kinds of cups. One with the lid here, this one is almost like a nipple and some children may need a soft nipple like cup and then make changes and then cups that can have a built-in straw so that it's anchored can often be helpful. And think about those straw drinking that they may get too much too fast. Well, use a narrower diameter straw, use a shorter straw, figure out what it is that the child can do and how do you change it in very small steps. This is a child who was in my clinic that I saw just a couple of months ago, came in almost six months old, will not take a bottle. Mom is breastfeeding. Mom needs to go back to work. She wants him to take bottles. He has totally refused bottles. And that's the case with some children. That was my own boys. They were breastfed and they were cup drinkers by six months of age. So I said, he's probably not going to take a bottle, but let's see what he does. This little guy with just a few little drops of water in the cup initially, look, he's holding on to it and he's actually taking it himself. So I said, please, can I take a photo of that to share with people? Because it's just remarkable what children will figure out what to do. Here is a child who had totally refused. Oh, a cup, okay. Ah, look at this guy drinking from that big boy cup. Boy. And that was total refusal at the beginning of this session. All right, how about Daddy Spoon? Here comes Daddy Spoon. With nice. That's his father anyway. who came in saying, I can't get him to take a spoon for anything. Every time I try to get him to take a spoon, he just totally refuses. Well, number one, they had glop of food on the spoon. So we started with just touch the spoon to his lip, dry spoon to his mouth. He's opening a couple drops of water on the spoon. He's accepting. And went from there. So this one is the flavored. Yep. I think break from it. Okay. Let's go back to the water. This is a kiddo who really hasn't wanted much at all. And we're just building on what he can do. And this is at a time when we really would have stopped earlier because he's been in this chair longer than we would typically do. So last drink, one more with the spoon. Permission. Good biting. And stop a session while a child would still do a little bit more. Not take them to the very end when they start fussing, crying. And if they're fussing and crying and they're taken out of the seat, what are we rewarding? They know all they have to do is fuss and cry and mom or dad will rescue me and get me out. So we want to reward when they are quiet and when they are cooperative. And it's amazing the changes that can happen in a very oh, short time. Okay. And then some children like to explore food. With mm -hmm. you, go, eh, you like coming down to the tray better, huh? Huh? You're looking at those that thumb there. That's got nummy on it. Mm -hmm. And then some children don't respond to that kind of practice at all. So there's no one way that fits all children. For the most part, you don't want children just playing with food, but experiencing it and having happy experiences. Those things are all critical and part of typical development and carry over to our children with special needs as well. Mm -hmm. Here's a 10 month old doing some finger feeding. Look, a little bit of lateral tongue action. Is it delicious? He's got almost a pizza grasp, not quite. Uh. Thanks to a speech pathologist on our staff for sharing that. And did you hear him going, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah? Uh. He's vocalizing with her as well. All right, now we're up kind of 10 or 12 months, self finger feeding. Increased coordination of jaw, tongue, lip movements, and many doing cup drinking, but not off the nipple completely, closing their lips around the spoon and using their lips to remove food from the spoon. But don't let parents come up along the palate with 
bringing that spoon back out because then what does the child have to do? The tongue has to come up, they got to reach the food and the first movement that they're going to make is to push it out. So you get a lot more spillage in that way. Here, look at this little guy doing finger feeding. He's at tracheostomy tube, he's on a ventilator, a speaking valve. If they can tolerate a speaking valve, you really want them to get the voicing of their own, as well as there is some evidence that they will do better swallow. Don't worry, mommy. What were you just doing? Good job. Good job. Now you probably heard that good job from whoever it was who's doing the um, responding to him. I tell parents it's okay to do good job or good boy, good girl at some times, but even more, you want to say, you used your lips. You put that in your mouth. I like the way you took a bite because then you are giving more language, vocabulary, making associations for speech and language development and rewarding what the child is doing and they're always a good boy or a good girl or do a good job, even if they're naughty. So we want to really reinforce the action, the activity that children are doing. And that holds for all children. Now, I know we need to talk about baby led weaning because there is a big emphasis and approach to that. And I get asked by parents, what do you think about baby led weaning? Or somebody will come in and say, well, we just had our child who just did fine because we did baby led weaning. So let me take just a few minutes here. It was first de described by Gil Rapley, at least as I did searching online and literature review as well, who was a health visitor and a midwife in Britain about 15 years ago. So the principle here is that instead of what we consider to be the typical way of introducing spoon feeding, at about six months of age, when children will be in a high chair. Here you have the child in a high chair, probably with the family meal time, and the parent puts, and I put this in quotation marks, large chunks of soft food on the tray. So the child grasps the food, self feeds the family food, and it is absolutely critical that there is not a choking risk because, as we said before, that's dangerous. So this is an approach in which infants feed themselves handheld foods instead of being spoon fed. And some of these children then don't want to be spoon fed at all. There is limited evidence about the efficacy or efficiency, but the baby led weaning infant shares the family food and meal times. They're offered milk and they may still be breastfeeding because remember they're probably six or seven months of age on demand until they actually self wean. Infants with developmental delay or other kinds of problems probably don't do well with the baby led weaning. They need to have those changes made in much smaller steps as we've already talked about a little bit. And of course there are concerns when children are not well or if they're recuperating from some illness, they may not be able to manage that more independent feeding. Now here are a couple of references for you. Now let's just think about pros and cons. The proponents of baby led weaning say, again, there's not much evidence here, but then we don't have a lot of evidence with some of the other things that we do either in terms of intervention and facilitating feeding. So the proponents say promotes healthy eating behavior, promotes weight gain trajectories, and there is evidence that is beginning to build as people are collecting data. But limitations of data, at least to this point that I could find, the conclusions are weak and research is needed to understand the approach in different contexts and with different populations. And maybe different cultures too. There may be some real differences in those respects. And we always need to think about um, where children are culturally and how the introduction of foods may differ. For instance, in some cultures, mom will partially chew food in her mouth and then put it into the child's mouth. In other cultures, that's really not a part of what we would do at all to advance textures with children. So we're always being conscious of that as well.
Now, what are some of the concerns for professionals? In terms of the nutrition, risks for iron and energy inadequacy. So that's where it's a real help that dietitians have a good picture of what the child is getting in this range of food to determine whether they are getting the expected range of vitamins and nutrients. And the potential as a choking risk. Evidence is lacking, there are still unresolved issues and research is needed. This comes from this article in 2018. Now, let me speak just briefly to choking risks. I do consulting for some of the major food companies when they're coming out with a new product for toddlers, young children, and risks for choking. Also, risks for choking on small toys because they are very similar. A general statement is to avoid round foods. And it's better if you can think about things in a strip or a rectangle, even if it's a very small strip or rectangle, but not cubes because cubes are almost like circles. And if you get this sort of a chunk into the mouth, it can get back over the tongue and then into the pharynx and a child may be at greater risk for choking. You want placement of those initial finger foods at the side on the molars. Coins, coins themselves are listed as one of the highest risk choking products. So I get very wary when I hear and I see in reports that people describe dime-sized, quarter-sized. Now, they're not giving a quarter, but I would suggest and encourage all of us not to use coin relationships when we describe shapes and try to stay away from round foods. Peas are really small, but having pea size or pea shape, that's the round. So I think I'm hypersensitive about that because of what I have seen when children have choked. And that's more likely to be when they're walking around with food and they're not seated and they're not supervised. So we have to take all of those things into account. Children should always be seated and supervised when they eat and drink. Also the hard foods, so hard candy, sometimes hard raw vegetables, some fruits and some meats. If they get swallowed whole, they could block the airway. So think about all of those aspects of choking risks as we advance textures as well. We also think about postural control against gravity. Remember, I'm a speech language pathologist. So I look to my PT and OT colleagues for this kind of assessment and recommendations, but we all have to look at all of these things as well. There's a direct influence on the development of coordinated oral motor function in terms of posture. And I have seen so many children when they will get the appropriate support in a seat when their core strength improves and their head control improves. You may not have to do very much work around the mouth because those other aspects lay such an important foundation. Now, we also know that if there is abnormal compensation for both oral sensory motor function, I would really include sensory motor here, and of abnormal movements in other parts of the body. So you get this reciprocal relationships and we have to take it all into account. So if we're doing something abnormal or compensatory in one aspect, it's may very likely have an effect on some other aspect. Interrelationships, the repetition of both normal and abnormal sensory motor information directly influences all of motor development. And if we have habitual repetition of abnormal or compensatory movements, we may have negative functional consequences throughout the system. So we can't go into detail about that during the session, but it is important that we're always thinking about those things. So what about the child at 13 to 18 months? They're taking essentially all textures, but not expected to take tough to chew food. They often scoop food to their mouth. They may still be using a combination of a whole hand grasp and a pincer grasp. They're still using primarily fingers rather than other tools, and they should be well coordinated with their phonation, their swallowing, their breathing, and they're getting lateral tongue action as they move food in their mouth. And most of them probably doing some straw drinking. 
Now, this is this little guy that you saw who had totally refused at six months, did have a feeding tube for a while. And as I recall, he also had eosinophilic esophagitis, which complicated things. Mm -hmm. great. That's great. That's great. Yeah, that's great. That kind of protein I can get in. Mm -hmm. He's not very picky anyway, though, is he? I mean, he eats pretty We're talking a little bit, not really it? loud enough, but. No. Now, is this new, the pasta or the. No, this is. He's right. familiar with that. This is pretty new. Um, fruits, he's not mis not very, not a lot of variety. No. Yeah. Just basically what? the one that starts with B-A-N-N. What? what? You got it, and mm -hmm. A-P-P-L-E. Mm -hmm. What do you want? And that's really it. Mm -hmm. Um, the veggies, B-R-O-C-C -C is the other one. You it's a, stu it's regular. Um. All right, the dad's kind of describing what's been happening recently, and he's still fairly limited in the range of foods that he likes, but you can see how independent he is, and he's really looking pretty appropriate for age, even though he's not taking a full range and he's still getting some tube feeding, and we've had to work through the eosinophilic esophagitis. That's a whole nother topic. Here you see a two-year-old who's being quite independent. This is just a photo, left-handed, and scoop, actually scooping food from that spoon. 19 to 24 months, they're continuing to refine the movements. More times with lip closure. Initially, children start with more of a vertical munch, so the mouth is open and food spills out. But by this age range, they should be getting food into the mouth, doing some chewable fooding, chewable foods, doing some rotary chewing along with the lateral tongue action, and they're pretty independent. Lip closure while chewing. In the typical child, one-handed cup holding, two-handed may still be used as well, but one-handed cup drinking, they can usually do open cup drinking if the cup's not too full without spilling. And they'll often use their fingers to fill up the spoon and often and using a fork as well. Here you see a two and a half year old. Take a bite. You're doing such a good job feeding yourself with your spoon. Oh, nice bite. Whoops. Not much on it. And that varies a lot too, doesn't it? So. so mom helps. Very nice bite. Nice chewing with your lips together. Take a bite. And you notice I said, nice bite. You took a bite. You used a spoon. So you don't have to have 25 different phrases and you don't need long sentences, but to do that kind of language stimulation along with the feeding is really useful. So how do we get texture expansion? Figure out what she accepts and how she manipulates and swallows. And this is probably the basic intervention slide. If you follow through this, you'll help most kids keep advancing. Change one dimension at a time in very small steps. Always a smaller amount with a new food. It may be barely dip the spoon. It may be barely get it to the lips or to the tongue. Let the child get that new taste or a little bit with a new texture. And then it's often very helpful to take the familiar food and make something maybe a little bit thicker or you change the taste a little bit and then alternate familiar and then one or two smaller bites with the new and then back to the familiar. And over time, then the new becomes the familiar and you keep advancing. You keep expanding toward smooth to lumpy to mashed to regular table food. And then on the liquid side, maybe you've started something that's a little bit thicker by open cup, thin it down gradually, get it till it's thin liquid, and then you get that whole range of textures, both on the liquid side as well as on the food side. It's got to be pleasurable. Some children like non-food related kinds of things. I do very little with that. Learn to eat is going to use food so that what goes into the mouth gets manipulated and swallowed, not just munched and nothing else happens. But a little bit of warm up may be helpful for some children, but we have to remember that we want to train to the task. So our intervention principles are based on typical development, 
Best to determine size, shape, taste. We don't want children to chew and spit. We don't want them just munching on a mesh bag because then they don't complete the process. We all learn best by short and frequent sessions. Now, of course, we have some major research needs. We don't have enough information about so-called normative feeding and swallowing development. It is important to think about neuroplasticity and neurophysiologic sensory motor learning principles. The neuroplasticity comes into play is that if we train off task, now we've got a habit that has to be undone to get to what we really want and the neuroplasticity can actually work against us. There's still a lot we don't know about neuroplasticity and the neurophysiologic principles of advancing, but we are learning more. But how do we manage to get randomized control trials with young children? That's really, really tough. And we need objective measures for function that are quantifiable so that what you do and you describe, I would be able to replicate and determine how to get those quantifiable objective measures. We also need research in terms of outcomes data for specific etiologies so that we could aid in developing evidence-based treatment protocols. I'm giving you here a few resources for parents that are helpful to all of us. I was almost wary about even doing just this one slide because I know there are so many others and I don't want you to think that, oh, this is what she uses and she doesn't even care about what so-and-so does or somebody else does. No, that's not the case. And I'm sure many of you could share with us some of these resources as well. What else? My two favorite four letter words in English. So they're not necessarily the same in other languages, but I'm always asking, what else? How can we build on what we do know in all of these areas? How do we determine functional measurable outcomes? We have to make sure parents and caregivers are integral members of the team. They know their child better than anyone else. And we have to think about what matters most to them. In fact, that's a question that we ask in our hospital at the beginning of every session. What matters most to you today? And then we can go from there. Respect the cultural differences, family's goals, but never jeopardize nutrition and hydration. And remember, more, whether it's more intervention, more frequent intervention, or trying to get more food into a kid at any one time is not necessarily better. In fact, it can be more of a stress. So in summary, I would just like to say that overall skill development is important and it correlates to feeding and swallowing. Remember to use adjusted and actually corrected is the more accurate term now, corrected ages for preterm infants up to 24 months and don't compare just to chronologic age. We all have to understand normal or typical development in order to look at the differences from normal. And if children are just delayed, they're actually easier to work with than if they are also disordered. But we remember that the range of variability among children is great, but the order of skills is fairly consistent. What we are doing in my head is balancing challenges and opportunities. And we can think of it in a whole variety of ways. Children's Hospital, now we have a new addition the beautiful art museum in Milwaukee and a statement from Hippocrates. If we could give every individual the right amount of nourishment and exercise, not too little, not too much, we would have found the safest way to health. So what else? Think about your own challenges and rewards. Just a few years ago, I rode a camel in the desert when I was lecturing in Egypt. I explored the Patagonia region with a couple of young men who were very helpful to me with the walking stick and the adventure that it was when I was lecturing in Chile. So you find your challenges and you find your rewards and always remember that what we are doing with these children, those of us who are working in therapy, we are working in the highest risk area of certainly for a speech pathologist because we could harm our children if we are trying to do too much too fast or not using the right textures or the right possibilities. So we always have to keep that in mind.
thank you very much. That is all I have to say at this point. I think we have a few minutes for questions and I will put this as the final slide. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Arvidsson, um, for, uh, yeah, as always, an amazing presentation that really, I think, brings out all of these kinds of issues for us working in pediatric feeding um, so eloquently. Um, I've, I've got, a, there's a couple of questions up on the list, and I think um, there's just a message there for people, if you could please type any questions that you have. Um, try and keep them sort of more or less relevant to Dr. Arvidsson's presentation. If you have more general ITSI questions, uh, there you can certainly visit the ITSI website um, to get them. So um, I'm going to uh, start with the first one, uh, and it says, what is your advice around dream feeding if this is the only way a mother can get a baby to take a bottle? Um, she's giving a sort of suggestion, a child's three months, no medical developmental issues being treated for reflux. Um, I, I would comment that I have seen this with some children who have had exposure for with um, uh, drug exposure and uh, often the high level of stimulus, they, they really seem to struggle with feeding and, and seem to feed best when they're in a more sort of semi-sleep state. Um, yeah, so I'll hand it over to Dr. Arvidsson. We do see a number of, sometimes we call them sleeper feeders, dream feeders. I think it's, it's all just a slightly different in the term. I see it with some babies that we think are just really typical babies, as well as those with the drug exposure, as you described, Janice. I don't know. We talk about it a lot with our team, our whole feeding team and also with lactation consultants because we work with them for the breastfeeders and sometimes it is breastfeeding, sometimes it's bottle feeding, oh. maybe either. And I think part of it- Don't, don't we, we lost you for just There's a There's something second about a little bit the frozen. system overall. Yeah, you're okay now. Am I okay you, you now? You just froze on that last, no, just that last Is it back? on the last question. I, I'm not sure if everybody had it, but I, I had sensed it was frozen. So um, if you could just go th through the end of that. And question. I saw a little sign across my screen that said your internet is unstable. So hopefully we can get through the next few minutes. It's almost like these babies who just their whole system relaxes more, is more calm. And it often does relate at least to some kind of GI tract discomfort. And we don't want to consider that way. But it's almost like they've got their days and their nights turned around because they usually do it better at night when the parent would like to be. But I don't think they're really totally asleep. Just because the baby has her eyes closed does not mean she's asleep. And yet there is this sense of calmness. I don't, can't find anything in the literature that gives me sufficient information to even answer your question in any truly meaningful way. We do urge parents to try gradually introduce either a daylight or a little soft music in the background or or something that could try to changes to get to a more typical state, which we would like to have them get as they get into that transition feeding. I would be happy to hear from any of you if you have more success with that. Because it seems like every time we turn around, there's another one. Yeah. Okay. Is there another question, Janice? Uh, yeah. Um, can you speak? Um to feeding according to developmental level for children with de delays, disabilities, rather than chronological age. It, it's not an exact science, but I'll use kind of a, one example. Let's say, for, ex for example, we've got a child who is 12 months of age chronologic, but she was a 24-weeker. So that means she's really eight months corrected age. But this child is not sitting independently. 
She is not rolling over. She is not crawling. So if we think about kind of a ballpark figure of where she's functioning developmentally, she's probably in maybe a three-month level, a four-month level at I think we're you're you're uh, we're losing you a little bit there, Joan, with your frozen. Um, Ellen, any suggestions for Joan? If we can, um, I'll just wait another minute or so, and, and we'll see how it goes. Um, we're just having some technical issues. Thank you so much for your patience. And hopefully Dr. Robertson will be able to join us again in, uh, in a second. Uh, are you back, Joan? At least it didn't happen while we were in the lecture. Okay, uh, Joan, try- But this um, can be even more important. Yeah, I'm going Joan, to could, take could... off my computer. We'll try, we'll try the screen share not being shared, see if that will help. Yes, I think we've, I think we've lost her now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm sure everybody's used to uh, the technical challenges that comes with uh, with the internet and managing that. We did pretty well to get through the whole presentation, which was excellent. Um, okay, let's see. We've, we seem to have lost <laughs> Dr. Avertson. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering, Ellen, if uh, just because I know there's a few other questions on the uh, on the list here for people, mm -hmm. um, are we able to uh, save some of those questions and perhaps Dr. Arvidsson could we could put them in the um, answers in the recording afterwards if we're able to get her back on. Uh, yes, I think uh, we can either do that, and that just means that the recording will take a little longer to, to go out, mm -hmm. or we can try and get these questions to her and maybe get them out on our next e-byte or, or sometime next month. Uh, okay. But we, we have a record of the questions that have been submitted. So I wonder if we should just uh, end the session now and, and then uh, figure out how to get these questions answered. Yeah. Um... Yeah, sorry about that, everybody. Um, we will t uh, take your questions because we see that there's a number of them that have come in and we didn't unfortunately manage to get to. Um, so I know uh, Dr. Arvidsson was having some major stormy weather over her part of the world. So maybe that's part and parcel of what happened with her. Um, but I would uh, thank you all very much for coming to the session today. And um, you know, we really appreciate uh, your interest in, in the webinars and with Etsy uh, stuff. So we will put up the recording. So if there was something you missed or, or wanted to check out, you can do that or share it with some of your other colleagues. Um, and um, I just, I don't know if our Dr. Harvitson's there, but I truly want to thank her for her, um, you know, being willing to share her vast knowledge and wisdom with us. Um, really, really appreciate the time that she's been able to, to give us for doing this. Um, and thank you for that. So we'll sign off and um, wish everybody well and be safe and healthy. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Arvidsson, for coming back to um, go through some of the questions that we weren't able to get to on our session on Thursday due to some technical difficulties. We really appreciate you taking the time, and I know the participants will really appreciate having their questions answered. So I'm just going to run through the questions we had outstanding um, and some of the ones that sort of weren't very clear during that and um, hand it over to you for your excellent uh, 
uh, information. So can you please speak uh, to feeding according to developmental level for children with delays and disabilities rather than chronological age? When we think about the chronologic age, it's really related very much to functional levels. So if you have a child who is, let's say one year, 12 months of age, but she was born at 24 weeks gestation, that makes her corrected age, which she deserves up until she turns two years of age at only eight months. So we would not expect a child of eight months if she was developmentally at eight months to be doing the same thing that a one-year-old might which would include drinking from a cup, doing some finger foods, and getting pretty close, maybe even to some of the table foods. But now let's assume that that child is not rolling over, does not sit independently, so head control is poor, maybe low tone overall. And we would estimate with our PT and OT colleagues, remember I'm a speech pathologist, that maybe that child is really functioning at three to four month levels. So if that's where the global functioning is and cognitive function could be close to that as well, we would not expect the child to be ready to do spoon feeding. We would not expect to be sitting in a high chair and she would still be doing bottle or breast feeding. And of course that could continue well after this age range anyway. But we have to look at all of those things in conjunction with what the actual age is. And then you also have to think about what might some other underlying conditions be. Mm -hmm. If they had a heart problem or gastrointestinal problem or other neurologic problems. So it's not very yeah. simple. It's mm -hmm. really very complex for all of these children. Great. And so we'll go to the next question. Yes, yes. And that's so true, so true. So um, what was your reason for not using mesh bags? You'd mentioned those um, a little bit in the session. I mentioned mesh bags briefly, along with other kinds of oral motor stimulation that does not include getting food into the mouth, manipulated and swallowed. So I am wary about some of those other, I'm going to say extraneous, tools to be used to facilitate feeding. That does not mean that they should never be used. But what it does mean is that what we are really looking for to train children as directly to the task and the function that we want for them, which means making a decision about what foods, what size, how they could get into the mouth so that we're really looking at what goes into the mouth is appropriate for that child to manipulate and then to swallow. And that can be very important because if you're chewing on a mesh bag, you get a little bit of flavor, but those children don't swallow what they, what's in that mesh bag. So now you've taught them part of a task, but you may have to undo that skill and then get them back on task for what you are really after. So the better we can train to the task to start with, the better we can help to facilitate those gains. But again, I'm going to emphasize, I'm not saying don't ever use those other tools, but be very cautious. Yeah. Understand what your goal, your ultimate goal is for those, for those children. Okay. Um, yes. Any advice around the specific Down syndrome population, especially regarding oral motor difficulties? We could have a whole lecture mm -hmm. about the whole range of skills and deficits in children with Down syndrome because they really are a very heterogeneous group. Yes, many of them have low tone, many of them have kind of a low and forward tongue posture, and they tend to be sloppy with their eating, maybe spill food out their mouths. I don't think that I can really talk specifically about that condition. Instead, what we really need to do is to think about those developmental skill levels that I just went through, what their global gross motor skills, trunk control, core strength, as well as what they are doing at their mouths and do they have any other underlying conditions and then work at 
if they can keep their lips closed because they can do mouth breathing, that can be a strategy that ties into both feeding as well as speech development. And look at how you can help to make the function be as um, age appropriate and think about making the changes in very small steps. And I think I did mention that in the lecture for all populations at all levels, the underlying principle about intervention is figure out what the child can do and where does that fit into developmental levels and overall skills and then make your changes in one dimension at a time in very small steps so that you can always determine if you need to back off a little bit. But if you're trying to do something that has changed texture, has changed taste, has changed the way it gets into the mouth, perhaps spoon compared to cup, compared to finger foods, then you don't even know how to really evaluate and figure out how to keep moving along. I don't know how to separate evaluation and intervention because they're all so intertwined. And every time you're working with a child, you are evaluating the situation to determine what the next steps might be. And all the time you're evaluating, you're thinking about what might be the strategies that you could incorporate, to begin to make some changes. So that's kind of a long-winded statement about a pretty straightforward question, but I'm hopeful that that will be helpful as you think about whatever populations and whatever age and level you're working with. Yeah, that's, it's so true. I think we tend to assume you can just sort of leap to, you know, a, a big step. And as adults, we often think, oh, well, that seems little. But in fact, for a child, it's got to be really much smaller. And that's certainly something that um, you see in practice and families, helping families understand it's we're really talking little steps. So um, uh, how often do you see isolated skill deficits orally, such as poor oral transit with normal swallow? Is it more likely to be a pointer to a more specific neurological difficulty? That can vary a whole lot as well. I have seen a number of children that I would predict that they have a pharyngeal swallowing problem with their really poor oral skills, maybe slow transit, limited tongue action. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, is that liquid, is that food getting back into the pharynx? Is it getting deep in the pharynx? Are they delayed in making a swallow happen? And for some of them, not every single child, but some, you have to do a video swallow study to define whether there is a pharyngeal swallow problem and they will look just fine in terms of their pharyngeal swallowing. I have seen infants and some children who may be 12 months of age or 14 months of age who are developmentally delayed and obviously neurologically impaired, who will suck five or six times to get enough out of a nipple to make a swallow happen, but there is no aspiration, there is no laryngeal penetration, there is no residue in the pharynx after the swallow. So then you really are reassured that you really have to work with the oral skills and you can feel comfortable because there is not, at least the best we can tell with a limited sample, a major pharyngeal swallowing problem. Might it point to a more specific neurologic difficulty? I think it could in some instances, but I will confess that off the top of my head right now, I'm not thinking about a specific diagnosis that I would say, oh yeah, it's most likely to relate to this one. So I have to hedge a little bit in that respect. Very pertinent question. These are all pertinent questions. Mm -hmm. We just don't have sometimes pretty obvious answers to them. But I think as we ponder some of these things and raise more questions and consider the global pictures and the interrelationships, then we can come up with some guidelines for specific patients. Mm -hmm. True. Um, so this is from a fairly new clinician who is wondering about tips on oral motor exercises and uh, sort of two parts and also um, th your thoughts on tongue tie in relation to feeding. First of all, let me just speak to oral motor exercises. There is really nothing in the literature that provides evidence for 
outcomes or the efficacy of oral motor intervention. A number of years ago with a group of speech pathologists with the direction from ASHA, the American Speech and Hearing Association, we looked at oral motor intervention for feeding and also for speech. And we looked at it for adults as also for pediatrics. So, you know, I was with the group for pediatrics. And out of hundreds of articles, there were very few that spoke directly to oral motor intervention. And since, as I do literature reviews on a very regular basis, we still do not have outcomes data. And I suspect part of it is that we, many of us who are clinicians, I am a clinician, most of you are clinicians in a variety of disciplines, we are doing intervention the best we can and not collecting the data that we really should be collecting in ways that we could report the outcomes. So with that being said, we have to be very cautious about the so-called oral motor exercises. You now, just like I said, I would never say don't ever use a mess bag. So I would never say don't do oral motor exercises. I do encourage everybody to think about oral sensory motor because in the context of doing motor exercises, you know there are sensory components as well. All the cranial nerves that innervate for swallowing have both sensory and motor components, except cranial nerve 12, that is motor to the intrinsic muscles of the tongue. So the best possible way is to use non-food oral exercises briefly and appropriately to a child's age and so they are not stressful. Some children like those, but some children find them extraordinarily stressful, whether it's using vibration or using some kind of tool that gets into their mouth. So you have to really pay attention to all of those things when you think about oral motor. If you, I won't say if, I should say when, you really pay attention to what the goals are I don't know if you can think back on that child that the dad said he would not accept a spoon at all. And I brought a spoon, poured his mouth, touched his lip, backed away, nothing on the spoon. At the time I did it just another time or two, he was opening his mouth, grabbing for the spoon and then accepting a little bit of water on it and very soon moving on to additional. When you do it cautiously and systematically. So I don't know that that actually answered your question, but I hope it gives you more I'm going to say food for thought. <laughs> now, tongue tie. Again, we could have a whole session on tongue tie. And it seems to be truly a hot topic, just as the person who asked the question mentioned. And there are differences of opinion. There are differences in approach to releasing a tongue tie and also to how severe it is. So I am just going to say, actually, a lactation consultant from children that I wrote a chapter on this topic for a pediatric laryngology book that's coming out very soon in, I don't know, third or fourth edition, to point out some of the um, ways to assess and also the things to think about. There may be an anterior tongue tie that's not, not very restrictive. There may be a posterior tongue tie it's difficult to identify that's very restrictive. Oh, I'm hearing the noon siren go off here. So I'm hoping it's not interfering with what we're saying here. I also find that some children will be able to stretch that tongue and that tongue tie becomes less noticeable as they are sucking and swallowing. What I do find is that the most restricted tongue tie, and you know you see that top of the heart indentation as part of your assessment, it's most likely to interfere with breastfeeding because they do need to get sufficient anteroposterior action of that tongue to do what I call strip a nipple. And that's part of what you are looking at with a mom, maybe with a lactation consultant, maybe you are a lactation consultant in the early feeding. The other thing you have to think about is what the implication might be for speech. Children do need to be able to lift that tongue tip sufficiently to get to the alveolar ridge to be able to produce ta, da, na, la, and get that tongue up fairly high to do the, the fricatives or the sibilance, s, 
you might not even hear those. But that you have to consider as well. Now, you didn't mention lip tie, but you also have to think about the potential of an upper lip tie because infants need to be able to flare out their lips to get a good seal on a breast as well as a bottle nipple. And if there is a significant tie, it may interfere and leave a gap between the two front teeth as children get older. So some of them can be monitored and just observed when they are very young, but it is useful for those of you who are working with children and you see that to be aware of all of those kinds of possibilities so that your monitoring can then maybe get them to the person who may be able to help in more specific ways. Great, excellent, thank you. Thank you, Joan. Um, <clears throat> so our last question, can you speak to introduction of purees to children with significant delays if they're well supported in a slight recline? Are there risks and advantages? So the example is um, risk of missing a window of opportunity to introduce solids. I'm thinking about a child who might not have trunk control even at 10 to 12 months corrected age, but is otherwise safe for bottles. It's certainly appropriate to introduce a spoon. And sometimes I have introduced a spoon with much younger children who will not take bottles. And the thing about introducing with a spoon, yes, they need to be well supported. And this person who asked the question mentioned that, that you can control the volume. It's not that you're gonna start right away with putting a glob of puree on a spoon. Most children, if they are at all wary about making these advances. And you know, many of the children that you see have had a lot of negative experiences. They may have gone through suctioning and maybe NG tube for a while, or maybe some other experiences that make them very wary about eating and drinking. So the couple of examples in the videos that I think I showed to you, just that presentation of acceptance, because you've got to have acceptance before you can move on and advance with whatever texture it is that you put on a spoon. So a big problem, I think, is that people think they can start spoon feeding a child at any point and they put a glob of puree on it and they think the child should accept that. No, start with a dry spoon, start with a couple drops of water or maybe their formula or breast milk and just see, do they suckle off that spoon? Do they look pleased with it? Do they make a swallow happen? Do they not get stressed with it? And then you can make something a little bit thicker and then a little bit more on the spoon. And just go in very small steps. It comes back to that. And always monitoring as to how the child is accepting of it and make sure that you are doing whatever practice you want to do that you keep it short, maybe five to 10 minutes. Don't work with the child for 30 or 40 minutes. And also encourage parents because parents are the ones who really follow through with their children. See what happens for maybe five or six trials, three or four times a day for a child who may be very wary or you're not sure is even really ready. And then you build on what the child tells you, what the child accepts. And then amazing things can happen that you would never have realized would ever happen because instead of thinking about a technique, although you may be using some of them, you are paying attention to what the child can do and what the child finds pleasurable and that lets you keep moving along. So I think that maybe we covered that question reasonably well, knowing that mm -hmm. there are still lots of other things we could talk about. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, Joan. And, and thank you, I think, I mean, so much around what you were saying is really paying attention to the child and those little steps, and those steps are always so much smaller than you think that they are. We sort of, as adults, run in much bigger. What we think small is not small at all. So, um, and I, I think we have to remember the size of these kids. They're a lot littler to them uh, as well versus like our sizing and things like that. So, yeah. And I often use an analogy to parents that what we think is one small step is probably about seven to the mm -hmm. child. So our expectations. And then the really important thing is acceptance. Acceptance builds the foundation. So if you're gonna build a house, you've gotta have a really strong foundation. 
it does not matter how beautiful the house is on top of it, it will crumble. So think foundation, acceptance, developmentally appropriate, and move along like the tortoise did in the hare and the tortoise mm -hmm. analogy of the Aesop's fable. It is yeah. so pertinent for yeah. those people who understand that, that um, analogy is that slow, steady, brain to the task, and eventually slow becomes faster because you don't have all these other things that have gotten in the way. I'm going to stop at this point. Perfect. Perfect. Yay for the turtle too. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joan. It's been fantastic. Really appreciate your time for both the talk that you did, but also taking the time to follow up on the questions. I know everybody, all our participants will truly appreciate it. So thank you again. My pleasure.